طيب السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, Welcome back for uh, our uh, uh, colleagues uh, and good, good afternoon for you uh, Before we are uh, get started I would like to again express uh, my sincere appreciation to all organizer, uh, organizers who generously helped us to make this event, uh, Simulation Week Activities 2020, and for giving me the uh, privilege of, of welcoming you. Uh, the second thing, uh, I would like to thank you for uh, to uh, every one of you uh, for being here with uh, us today, and we are very pleased to be able to welcome those uh, of you that have been with us for a long time uh, now, as well as those who are new uh, to Saudi Society for Simulation and Healthcare. Let me introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Dania uh, Hassan Al-Jaroudi. Uh, she is a consultant of obstetric and gynecology, reproductive Uh, into chronology and infertility uh, and uh, minimally invasive gynecology surgery. She will be talking about the postpartum hemorrhage and simulation in obstetric. And by uh, the end of this uh, session, uh, we uh, you will be able, of you, all of you, to know the simulators in obstetric. And, um, we'll get some experience from uh, Dr. Dania about uh, her experience in King Fahad Medical City. Um, by the way, the, Dr. Dania, she is working in King Fahad, King Fahad Medical City in Riyadh. Welcome, uh, Dr. Dania, and the floor is open for you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu ala Rasulullah. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to present uh, something and uh, uh, my humble experience in uh, simulation in obstetrics. We've been uh, doing uh, some courses at KFMC about uh, postpartum hemorrhage and obstetrics. So let me share with you our uh, experiences. I, uh, I have nothing to disclose. And our objectives of this uh, talk is uh, to introduce to to you a case scenario that we have faced, introduction on simulation in medical education, simulators in obstetrics, experience at KFMC, and does it really work, and its cost effectiveness and future directions. So as um, we can start here, we had uh, once a resident who is in his second year of his training. He was sitting in the doctor's office on delivery suite, and suddenly the emergency buzzer goes off, and the student midwife pops her head and uh, out of room six and she, saw, uh, she started shouting postpartum hemorrhage. So the resident was thinking, I need to act now. Where is my senior? I haven't managed many PPH scenarios before. So in his mind, he was thinking how to manage postpartum hemorrhage. And I'm sure you know, everybody's also thinking, do you think if the resident has taken a course in PPH or simulation, he could have reacted faster, was more confident and arranged his management steps in, he in his head better. So remember the intrinsic uh, dual function of a labor ward in creating a relaxed atmosphere for normal childbirth while simultaneously being prepared for life-threatening emergencies makes it challenging workplace that requires flexible, highly knowledgeable staff skilled in clinical problem solving and ability to multidisciplinary cooperation. A high level of communication and excellent cooperation skills are also necessary when interacting with laboring women. Simulation-based medical education is a complex intervention, and despite the growing number of studies, knowledge gaps still exist, and many key elements of simulation-based training remains to be analyzed in depth. So what is simulation? I'm sure most of you know what is simulation, but it's a method or technique that is employed to produce an experience without going through the real event. Simulation opens up opportunities that are not available in real event learning, such as apprenticeship, and at the same time provides a multifaceted safety container for learning. The safety container is an important consideration for learners, especially in professional training. Simulation also can provide a safe environment to reflect on and learn from mistakes without the threat to professional identity. Why should we use simulation for learning? So the Institute of Medicine has documented high rates of pre uh, preventable medical errors over the years and demanded a fundamental change in the healthcare delivery system. One of the 13 recommendations in the report was the need to restructure medical education to be consistent with the principles of the 21st century health system. 
Why do we need simulation? So medicine has learned much from professions that have established programs in simulation for training, such as aviation, military, and space. So increased demands on training hours, limited patient encounters, and a focus on patient safety have led to a new paradigm for education in healthcare that increasingly involves technology and innovative ways to provide a standardized curriculum. So why simulation again? As you all know, you know learning, when you learn and you teach others, the, you grasp the information 90% of the time. And then here, when you do simulation, you get 75% uh, retention of your information. So here, the image on the left part uh, shows the learning, especially using simulation for practice, provides the highest level of retention of training, second to teaching others. And then the rest goes down, group discussions, demonstration, audiovisual reading and lecture. So simulation-based learning is the most effective technique for developing every professional's knowledge, skills, and attitude whilst protecting the organization from unnecessary risks. It is useful in resolving practical dilemmas and provides for real-time benefits. So what is simulation-based learning? So exper uh, exper uh, experiential and repetitive learning. While in traditional lecture-based training, the desired outcome is merely explained. In simulation learning, individuals achieve an outcome from first-hand experience. Adults, like most people, learn better through experience. In the simulation, individuals have opportunity for repetitive practice, which helps increase retention. It is also knowledge integration. A key facet of any learning is that understanding is increased when it is linked to some already known piece of knowledge. Simulation-based learning, because of its participatory nature, has the added benefit of being able to psychologically link concepts and allow participants to link knowledge areas through their actions. It's also risk-free learning environment. Regardless of our attitude, learning research validates that we learn by making mistakes. In fact, they are invaluable to the participants. If ex uh, executive decision makers can participate in relevant and realistic simulations, they can safely make mistakes, learn from them, and promptly apply their learned knowledge to the real work challenge, avoiding costly mistakes or unintended consequences. Also in simulation, we are able to adjust the level of difficulty. The technology provided in most simulation-based learning tools are designed to allow the difficulty level to increase as the competency of the individuals and teams improve. So you can make it harder and harder as uh, you go through the simulation experience. This provides additional flexibility and continuing learning opportunities for the varied level of experienced personnel. How can simulation be used for learning purposes? Adult learners learn differently than children because of maturity and life experience. Therefore, the design of education activities should take into account the nature and assumption of adult learning. There are a number of elements that are needed in order to create an effective learning environment for adult learning using full-scale simulation. So what is the effective learning adult environment? So first, a team of learners who interact as they have done or would do in their real situation. You need an environment resembling a real clinical environment. You need the equipment that they, you use usually in real practice your learning experience that is a problem centered and is close to the clinical encounters. Learners need to feel safe to express themselves. Learners receive timely feedback from different sources. Medical simulation. Medical simulation allows the acquisition of clinical skills through deliberate practice rather than an apprentice style of learning. Simulation tools serve as an alternative to real patients and a trainee can make mistakes and learn from them without being afraid of harming the patient. So this is a study that shows what is simulation in medical education, which is a method or technique to produce an experience without going through the real event. There are multiple elements to consider for simulation program, and technology is one of the many dimensions. The ultimate goal is to engage learners to experience the simulated scenario, followed by an effective feedback and debrief. So the following are some principles which simulation teaching can be utilized for. First, you need to assess skills examination evaluation of simulated situation you need cooperation of teams so teamwork is very important that is frequently featured in healthcare simulation scenarios you need to have empathy even though it's a mannequin or uh, an act you need to have empathy and allow learners to demonstrate empathy for the simulated patient and for the roles of the uh, other team members also the social system simulation involves complex social interactions between team members of varying levels of authority and experience your concept also demonstrates concepts to reach a diagnosis and then skills, you apply them. Application of psychomotor skills is an important task of simulation teaching. 
also efficacy during simulation. Learners can see the effect of their actions and determine if their actions achieves the desired effect. You need to pay the penalty, which is since simulation will allow for mistakes, consequences of those mistakes can be seen and discussed rather than harm the patient. The role of the chance, while one advantage of simulation is standardization, there is still an element of chance being introduced as unintended consequence. So also the ability to think critically through the process of reflection, either reflection and action while simulation scenarios is progressing or reflection on action after simulation is complete, learners develop the skills needed to critically analyze their own actions and develop new strategies. So this is an example of uh, simulation in healthcare education, and this is a best evidence practical guide so here, there are different phases in simulation for healthcare education. So you need to plan, you then implement, you evaluate, and you revise your plan. For example, here, if you want to plan, let's say you, know, you want to do a curriculum. So you develop a curriculum with an expected outcome. For example, cardiovascular system in medical school, the undergraduate nursing curriculum, continuing education requirement for a given specialty. You can also plan to determine outcomes that are best addressed using simulation with clinical skills, procedures, IV lines, problem solving, teamwork. You can also determine simulation to be used based on the, your resources and teaching intervention, like you have full mannequins, task trainers, uh, virtual reality standardized patients, mixed mobility. You can also determine mode of delivery for each intervention, mesela facilitator-led small groups, peer-led self-instruction, you can develop a content for based uh, simulation based exercises or scenarios like cases, scenarios, and skill lab. When you want to implement here, implement the simulation based educational exercise and new curriculum. Masalan, pilot test with a sample group. You start piloting a small group and you test it and you see if your scenario is good enough. You troubleshoot any component as they arise during this phase. So you start doing scenarios which may take longer or shorter than planned and more prompts are needed for learners or something that is missing. Then you start evaluating your effectiveness and your outcomes. You assess the skills, the knowledge, the attitude, and the clinical impact. You also evaluate the instructor satisfaction, the learner satisfaction, and you, you take their uh, feedback. And then you revise. You Based on your results and uh, of evaluation and new evidence, you make revisions as needed and <laughs> you continue to do so. So practice points in simulation is, uh, as you know, is increasingly being used in healthcare education to teach cognitive psychomotor effective skills to individuals and teams. It is important to first determine the outcomes of using simulation and utilize these to guide its integration into curriculum. Feedback is critical to effective learning using simulation and should be guided by individual learning needs. Simulation allows for training in a controlled environment with opportunities for deliberate practice and assessment. Simulation-based mastery learning significantly improves skills for all participants and leads to skill retention. And further research is needed in the areas of instructional design, outcome measures, translation and implementation science in the context of simulation. So is it good to integrate simulation in training? The following are the goals to be achieved with the integration of simulation masala for the curriculum of ob residency training program. So we thought training in a controlled and safe environment is good. Utilization of multiple learning strategies, depending on the complexity of the task, uh, task and level of training in order to achieve competency. Personalized repetitive practice and self-regulated learning to achieve the needed skills. Structured constructive feedback to reach mastery level. Achieve technical and non-technical skills. Provide standardization and effective replication. This will reduce the variation between various residency programs around the kingdom and improve the training programs. So what are the differences between simulation and drills? Simulations are fictitious, not real. And they are as realistic as possible. They are well adjusted to specific skills and the results you need to improve individual skills and teamwork. The drills, however, are real. They take place where events actually occur. They happen unannounced in real time. And the results you need to improve individual skills and teamwork and improve the performance of the health service as a whole. What about uh, simulation in obstetrics? So obstetric emergencies are rare. Experience is needed. Obstetric emergencies are mostly unexpected. Immediate action is required. High risk situations might lead to medical legal consequences and the complications in obstetrics are one in 12 deliveries. So why do we need to do that? We need to improve maternal care, their outcomes, their teamwork, their communication together, their team roles, and the situation awareness. 
So in OB, we, you know, like in other areas as well, we train together, we work together. So it is the nurse, the doctor, the assistant, and it has to be multidisciplinary. As you can see, midwife, obstetrician, anesthetist, neonatologist, hematologist. So what about obstetric emergency training? Like we have common scenarios in the obstetric field, maternal hemorrhage, failed intubation, anesthesia, eclampsia, severe uh, preeclampsia, maternal cardiac arrest, core prolapse, shoulder dystocia. Also in the delivery uh, settings, we have high, low, medium fidelity, uh, fidelity simulation, multidisciplinary, multi-professional teams, a semi-center lab based or in situ in the hospital or in the world. So this was uh, like a group of uh, simulation-based uh, you know, training in acute obstetric or emergency. And there were different courses that were uh, developed over the time, starting in the 1990s in UK. And then in the US, this is an important course for obstetricians, which is called also. As you can see, personnel is OB midwifery. Uh, midwifery. Individual teams are individual. Distance in situ, they're distant. Local, national, they're national. Duration is usually two days. Models, we need models to uh, make uh, people practice. And description with lectures and models and the assessment is with MCQs and scenarios. So simulation in obstetrics and gynecology. So simulation is essentially any skill practice outside the patient care. Lower fidelity simulations might be as simple as learning how to suture on a suture board. Skill-based simulation training also allows learners to practice procedures such as laparoscopy, endometrial or vulval biopsies and forceps delivery. Larger team-based drills can simulate high-acuity, low-frequency events in obstetric and gynae surveys, such as maternal cold, eclampsia, and intraoperative hemorrhage. So is there evidence to show that simulation works in obstetric field? This, there were many publications and this was one of them. So change in knowledge of midwives and obstetricians following obstetric emergency training. And this was a randomized control trial for a local hospital, simulation center and teamwork. So what they have found, there was a significant increase in knowledge following training. The mean MCQ score increased by 20, uh, 20 points and the participants also increased their MCQ score. So their conclusion was that practical, multi-professional obstetric emergency training increased midwives, doctors' knowledge of obstetric emergency management. Furthermore, neither the location of training in a simulation center or in local hospital, nor the inclusion of teamwork training made any significant difference to the acquisition of knowledge in obstetric emergency. So what are the training options in, uh, in, uh, in obstetrics? So there are low and high fidelity simulators low fidelity versus high fidelity. Simulation in obstetrics, as you can see, there are many mannequins and examples for uh, uh, embryo, embryo mannequins or fetuses or Noel with, with uh, patients who are delivering and a baby that simulates the real world. So the use of obstetric simulators dates back to as early as the 18th century. It is said that Madame de Coudray in the, in the 1700s, used to run practical courses of childbirth assistance, and she used a portable leather mannequin that reproduced the feature of the uterus with a cavity in which to insert the dummy of the fetus, and she started teaching uh, midwives how to deliver the babies. So thanks to this birth machine, she found it easier to teach the population of the countryside which maneuvers were to be used during easy or complicated vaginal delivery. So this is the... the uh, the simulator she used in the 1700s and then as you can see with time this has developed this was just as a, a leather mannequin with a baby and the placenta low fidelity simulation for skill development while high fidelity models are great at simulating real world situations they aren't always necessary to teach procedural skills attaining these skills require a lot of practice and in the early stages of training we wouldn't want medical students or residents to hone these skills using patients Instead, we use everything from citrus pool to board games to handmade bedroom cup models to teach them. Low fidelity simulation models give learners the opportunity to practice throwing knots, for example, before they get into the operating room. Here is an example also of a low fidelity. You just can see a piece of um, cloth, and as if this is the uh, vagina where the baby gets delivered, this is a small doll with a placenta. And, uh, you know, this is a simple cross-shaped placenta that uh, you, can, uh, you can simulate. Also, low fidelity is an example of neoperine uterine simulator, just a small uh, baseball uh, ball 
that you can use and simulate مثلا, a postpartum hemorrhage and uh, uh, demonstrate for the students how to control the hemorrhage. This is also a piece of meat whereby the students can learn how to suture a perineal tear after delivery with a small piece of meat, a condom, and a chocolate, and then you just make the tear and show the students how to repair the laceration. And I just want to mention here about the uh, piece of meat for perineal tear. The phone simulator had a cost only of $5, and the CV laceration cost only $2.5. So high fidelity simulation focuses on teamwork and communication skills. In order to give learners all levels, as medical students, residents, fellows, physicians, nurses, experience in high equity, acuity, low frequency obstetric and gynecology surgery emergency, who can use high fidelity simulation. These can be fully automated, often taking place in a simulated operating room or birthing room. Educators separated from simulation by a two-way mirror are able to speak for the mannequin and control every vital sign. Mannequin has a detectable pulse and breath sound. It can deliver a baby, and the tubing can even be set up so that the mannequin can bleed or leak fluids. These simulated emergencies involve the entire multidisciplinary team and give everyone a chance to develop the teamwork skills by close group communication skills, delegating tasks necessary as in, in the emergency without sacrificing the patient's safety. So I will just give uh, you a few examples of what are uh, what uh, trainers are available in the market uh, simulator. Like there is a simulator for cesarean section. There, uh, this is an interesting one. Before the residents or uh, fellows, my son goes into delivering a baby. They show them how to deliver a baby with a cesarean section fetal extraction training, which is called CCDA. So it demonstrates a baby how to cut the cord, how to deliver the placenta, what uh, instruments to use and so forth. Also for there is a training which a uh, trainer which is called postpartum hemorrhage control trainer. This also you know like deals with high risk emergency in obstetric which is the postpartum hemorrhage and it uh, demonstrates for the learners how to take care of such an emergency using a trainer. There's also a trainer which is called emergency hysterectomy trainer. Sometimes we need to do remove the uterus quickly during an emergency and this trainer is uh, there to help us teach the students or residents or uh, fellows how to remove the uterus in a quick fashion during emergency. Other simulators are the model for gynecological patient education. It's called the 3 P smart anatomy. And then as you can see here, it's a demo for the pelvis and uh, uh, the pelvis and the vagina. So also this is an introductory obstetric lab basic kit. It shows us the fetus, how does it grow, what uh, gestational age, and then it demonstrates it when the baby really gets ready to be delivered. There's also a uh, high fidelity new sim one birthing simulator. It shows, uh, it helps uh, uh, the students and residents train on a simulator and shows them how to deliver a baby. This is an interesting one that we have also at KFMC, which is postpartum hemorrhage trainer, PPX trainer, the delivery content. It has, the, as you see, the pelvis, the trainer, blood reservoir here to uh, mimic, you know, there's a really actual bleed here, a bleeding blood reservoir scan, artificial blood, and two placenta. So the PPH trainer, as you can see, the postpartum hemorrhage, which is a real risk in obstetric and gynecology, the, the bleeding after delivery, trainer offers accurate anatomy, including ischial spines, pubic bones, and sacrum. For a realistic feel and texture, in addition to a lifelike softness, the vaginal canal and postpartum cervix have been made in high quality silicone. The pump attachment allows easy adjustment of the uterine tone to simulate an atonic or contracted uterine. So the trainer will be useful for training of those uh, trainers with the following procedures. Mesela it can teach them how to deliver a placenta, identify postpartum hemorrhage bleeding, uterus bleeding, cervical bleeding, vaginal bleeding. It also has a visual estimation of blood loss, mesela up to 1.5 liters, and what are the students going to do. Atonic uterus, practical fundal massages, practical bimanual compression, and catheterization with uh, channel 14 catheter. So developing a simulated learning experience. These scenarios are time and labor intensive. So they take time and they really, you know, like need lots of preparation. Sometimes, you know, we just do it once or twice a year because it needs a lot of preparation and uh, it's time consuming. 
So after defining the learning objective, we develop the patient presentation, write a script for what will happen based on the learner's actions, work with education specialists in KFMC stressing simulation center, and we need to ensure materials we need are available. So that for the learners, there are frequently four steps in simulated learning. The pre-reading, where learners study literature related to the topic, that's what sometimes we ask them, before you come for a, such a course, please read before about the topic. And the pre-brief, which includes the team introductions, we tell them uh, who are we and what are the team's roles. We review the learning objectives with them. You know, while well, we need to, you to understand how to manage muscle and postpartum hemorrhage, reduce performance anxiety, tell them to relax, take a breath, and uh, try to perform as, uh, uh, as uh, normal as possible. We assure learners that this is a safe and confidential learning environment, what stays What's, uh, what is in the simulation center stays in the simulation center. We try to make them relax and encourage them to treat the simulation as if it was a real life scenario. Then we go uh, with the simulation itself and then the debrief at the end, which includes discussion about what went well and what could improve and what can we do better. And is usually four to five times longer than the simulation itself. This is true. Yani. It takes time to explain and show them what they have done. Simulation also can be exciting, affordable, standardized, and effective way to educate caregivers in obstetrics and gynae, and they prompt patient safety through communication and teamwork. With a wide range of teaching modalities, every interaction and procedure a learner might undertake with a patient could be simulated in some fashion, whether in a lab or with standardized patients. So what do we need to know about simulation effectiveness? Is it really effective? Are we doing a good uh, job in teaching the residents on simulators? So reviews on simulation-based medical education conclude that in comparison with no intervention at all, the use of technology simulation in education for health professionals has a large effect on the outcomes and it's good. And it's better for their knowledge, it's better for their skill and behavior and a moderate effect on patient-related outcomes. So where do we do simulation? The simulation setting could be off-site or inside. The important term for simulation setting in this is OSS uh, uh, off-site simulation center, OSS in-house training rooms in hospitals, announced inside the simulation, or oh, unannounced inside the simulation. So simulation-based medical education has traditionally been conducted off-site in settings or contexts such as simulation centers, but some hospitals also provide in-house training in rooms specifically allocated to training. Off-site simulation as simulation-based medical education, where the setting is either a simulation center or in-house training, training facility consisting of rooms in the hospital set up for simulation training, and that resembles the simulation center facility, facility to some extent. So the insight to simulation and yani inside the hospital was defined by Riley as a team-based simulation strategy that occurs on patient care units involving actual healthcare team members within their own working environment. And this could be demonstrated in, in uh, obstetrics in a labor room. We can uh, do a simulation in situ in the labor room rather than doing it in the simulation center. So in situ simulation is a blend of simulation and real work environments providing training where people can actually do the work. In situ simulation can be conducted as either announced or unannounced. The latter is called a drill. So as you can see here is an example of uh, a journey that the patient goes through when she wants to deliver. This journey when laboring woman undergoes is either an emergency cesarean section or experiences postpartum bleeding. So as you can see here, the patient goes to the delivery room and her partner is with her. There's a midwife, there's a nurse, there's a, another midwife, there's the obstetrician. And then in the operating theater, there is the operating room nurse, the anesthesia, the anesthesia nurse, the doctor, and her partner at some times, and the newborn. And then at the end, when she goes to the postnatal ward, she needs to be seen by obstetric nurse and doctors and midwives and her partner and the newborn. So it's a bit of a complex thing that you can really simulate in a real world. And uh, even if you simulate it, you can just maybe simulate part of the journey and not the whole thing. So let me share with you our experience at KFMC. This was a KFMC initiative whereby we developed a simulation curriculum for postpartum hemorrhage, which is an emergency in obstetrics. We've developed the curriculum, the needed, uh, uh, needed objectives, the target audience, and then we developed a schedule 
and we have really conducted the course uh, which has helped uh, many residents. So the course overview in KFMC for PPH, uh, this was a half day course and uh, where participants will learn the best practice in recognizing managing patients with PPH. They will have a chance to practice the skills on high fidelity simulators such as the well. They will apply all practical points and they manage PPH in addition to basic life support and maintain vital signs. The candidates will also be taught on how to consent the patient, how to improve the communication with her and work effectively with others in interdisciplinary manner and multidisciplinary teams to provide high quality and safe uh, patient care. So the duration, uh, duration of training session is usually half day. Frequency of the course, we put it uh, once or twice a year. The number of trainers to come and attend the sessions before Corona, it's 14. And numbers of faculty uh, from the OB team was only three. As you can see here, the schedule, the time uh, for registration, time for presentation, giving them a brief on PPH, and then uh, the, the skill uh, stations that run uh, through the next, rest of the day. This is the simulation case template. We also put a case template for PPH. The total time was 45 minutes. The course director was myself and other consultants. Learning objectives is, as we mentioned, demonstrate competency in <laughs> recognizing patient <clears throat> with PPH, provide effective immediate interventions for patients with PPH, use appropriate communication skills for effective teamwork, and provide safe and high quality care for PPH. The case description, as uh, we also described the case, a 30-year-old female patient with a post-normal delivery. Her mom comes up uh, outside the room after 10 minutes and she started shouting for help because her daughter has lost a lot of blood and she needs help. So the venue was in the simulation lab. The patient information is Noel, our Noel simulator. Her age was 30. We assumed that her weight was 85. Her gender was female. Case presentation was the mother calling for help. Past medical history hypertension. We assumed that uh, the blood pressure is so and so. And we, uh, we wanted the uh, participants to do focused history and physical exam and that the patient is bleeding. We also developed a checklist whereby we wanted to know the candidates are answering the right, uh, asking the right questions and answering them right. So a checklist was developed, how much blood has been lost, how long ago has she delivered, the birth weight, the length of labor, and other questions that they need to answer for them uh, to be able to pass the station. And then at the end, we did the course evaluation. These are some pictures. And, uh, you know, like low fidelity simulators that we used, such as a uterus from a crochet or uh, from a piece of cloth. And then we started uh, teaching them how to use a battery balloon into the uterus to stop the bleeding. This is also one of our simulation courses, which is the also course that is usually conducted in the National Guard or sometimes at KFMC. And these are the, the learners here and trying to demonstrate what we do what to do in, a, in an obstetric emergency. This is another example of Noel that we have mentioned. Uh, this is what we have at KFMC. This is a Noel birthing simulator with birthing and resuscitation baby. And here are the um, characteristics of such a model that can, uh, you know, like this model can talk, can uh, express, can, uh, you know, we can demonstrate bleeding, demonstrate normal delivery or a problem with delivery. This is at KFMC. This is the Noel birthing simulator. Uh, these are all equipments at KFMC. And then this is the Noel there. So the PPS simulation course is uh, designed in accordance to obstetric-based training curriculum, and it aims to complement clinical obstetric training. And as I said, 9 to 15 participants. So this is us at KFMC. The residents participate in delivery simulation with a mannequin while a consultant controls its respiration and heart rate, blood pressure, speed of delivery, and vocal cues. And yani some of us uh, stand in the back, some of us stand uh, in a different room to see what the learners are doing. So as you can see, here's the bleeding. Here are the residents. They're trying to work as a team to help the patient. So as you can see, this is a background room whereby uh, one of our residents were simulating uh, that uh, Noel was screaming and that she needs uh, to interact with the patient uh, rather than just uh, treat her as a, as a mannequin. So the debriefing, we just take, uh, we, uh, take consent from the, the participants to allow, allow us to take pictures and record. 
And after we record, we show it to them. And uh, as you know, the three phases of debriefing, which are the reactions, we need to make sure that they clear the air and vent. Some of them are upset. Some of them, they feel that's a career scenario. Some of them are angry. So you just let them vent. Understand how to improve this, uh, their performance. You start exploring their trainee's brain. Discuss and teach. Help move trainees to the new frames and skills. You generalize and apply lessons learned. And summary you distill um, the lessons learned. What worked well and what should have uh, changed or for the next time. What are your takeaways? This is important uh, for them at the end. So summary what went well, what are your takeaways at the end and uh, evaluation of the course. What should happen next? That's our problem sometimes with the, uh, the courses. I think it's important for everyone who conducts such course to look at the outcomes of our course. Does it really affect training in real life? But sometimes we don't follow up and we don't see the difference of this uh, on our participants. However, in the States and the UK, they usually follow, after they do simulation uh, sessions, they follow up and they see if this really affected the outcome. And this was one of the studies where it showed obstetric simulation, designing simulation-based medical education and the role of physical fidelity. The focus is design of simulation and choice of setting in simulation-based medical education. They wanted to see that you can simulate everywhere and they wanted to look at the effect. So this study also, they have done a flowchart for obstetric skill uh, for a training program, and they wanted the residents to be trained on different, different aspects of uh, scenarios that happen in the labor room. And they timed it. In June 3rd, we will do obstetric training uh, initiation. On November, we will do a questionnaire before we start. On November 3, we'll do the steering committee meeting. And then uh, on November 3 to April, we will do the actual simulation and so forth, where they follow their, uh, their simulation-based training on different times, and they look at the outcome. So they have evaluated the present mandatory simulation-based training program in a large obstetric department, and they demonstrated that it has uh, had a positive impact on the participants, and they were really doing very good. So they, the participants, they've seen that they were satisfied with the program and they have learned a lot and they changed their work routines. So at the same time, an impact on the uh, organization level was found with changes in guidelines and equipment. They have found there were defects and they started fixing their, these defects in actual life. And they started fixing it in the labor, labor world and it reduced sick leave among midwives and data on the prevalence of some obstetric emergencies that seems to suggest that identification and management of PPH was given more focus following training. So what they have done, they have uh, done changes after implementation of the training program. This I think we should also try and do. So they looked at clinical, uh, they developed clinical guidelines in PPH, shoulder dystocia, preeclampsia, they put them in place. They did algorithms for basic neonatal resuscitation after the, that course. They highlighted the guidelines and laminated cards and they put them in the labor ward where uh, common problems happen. They filled in the forms, they did blood tests, they laminated everything. And uh, they've done many changes. They put new clocks uh, over the delivery bed and they had a condensed version of teaching material used during their training session were also laminated and hung in the wall and in the cabinets whereby people can have access to. So the need, yes, methods to assess and optimize obstetric training are urgently required in order for women and their babies to benefit from the expensive and complex intervention. Evaluation uh, should be integrated as an important part of the training and evaluations are often inconsistent or lacking. So what made it successful? In that example I've shown you earlier, the example of mandatory obstetric training program had an impact on both the individual and on the organization. These uh, courses have really helped the people and the mortality and morbidity rate has really reduced. Implementation of the training program was feasible without a skill center. They did it on site. A vital resource behind the success described in the study was the development and implementation of a training program that involved representatives of all health professionals, midwives, doctors, staff with education and obstetric competencies, plus a supportive management team. So this also was another article which showed an unannounced insight to simulation of obstetric emergencies, staff perception and organization impact, 
they found that this really helped a lot. So the prerequisite of unannounced in situ, yani if we want to do a simulation and go to the labor room, for instance, and do uh, in situ simulation, before participating, uh, participating in unannounced, unannounced ISS, staff are required to attend the department's mandatory of such a training program, which was established in the UK in 2003. Staff must be informed in advance of planned unannounced ISS, which is in situ simulation. They need to be told. Instructor, instructors must be prepared to cancel scheduled unannounced ISS in the event of heavy patient load, staff shortage, or recent severe upset emergencies. The unannounced ISS must not pose any risk to real life patient care, which means extra staff must be available to replace staff participating in unannounced ISS. The planning of unannounced ISS and the debriefing must be systematic and focus on identification of systematic errors, quality improvement initiatives, and the need of future training. Immediately after taking part in unannounced ISS, participants must be given the opportunity to retain, retrain on mannequins and provide a written guidelines. Facilitators of the debriefing must write a report based on the information that emerges. Uh, emerges. This report must be approved by S I ISS participants and subsequently distributed to all department staff. Then, if suggested changes are relevant, your management and department's quality coordinator must assist with problem solving and work to implement the recommended change. It cannot go with just going un unannounced and you don't do any changes afterward. So this is our... Uh, important advanced life support and obstetric also course and now it has been it has uh, starts to become mandatory for all residents before they go into the labor so now talking about the cost is the cost of simulation a problem so this was a cost analysis study that looked at the cost effectiveness of uh, doing simulators and as you well all know that it is cost effective they wanted to optimize the return on investment in training, assessing resource requirements, associated costs, subsequent outcomes can inform stakeholders about potential sustainability of the simulation-based education. Healthcare stakeholders and decision makers will benefit from more transparent, consistent, rigorous, and explicit assessment of simulation-based education program and implementation of costs in low- and high-income countries. So another study also was done, and it showed the cost-effectiveness <coughs> of simulation-based team training and obstetric uh, emergencies, which is called the TOSTI study, and they have shown that it really uh, was cost-effective. And multi-professional team training in a medical simulation center is cost-effective in a scenario where repetition training sessions are performed on site. So I'm just going to give you examples of the prices of some of the models. As uh, I have shown you earlier, the low fidelity, they're very cheap, $5, $6, and there are the high fide uh, fidelity uh, simulators that are really expensive. It can go up to $8,000, $4,000, and $3,000, and you need to sit with your team and decide which one to buy and which one would be more cost effective. This is another obstetric phantom set. It's $1,900. This is another. The Noel is $4,000. And uh, as I said, we need to look at what is more cost effective for our center and our need. What are the limitations of simulation? While realism has been achieved in many areas of patient simulation, there are still many other areas of patient uh, anatomy physiology that have yet not been realized, such as the feel of the skin, your color, skin temperature, ability of the environment to be re recreated, such as high stress environment of a critical care unit is difficult to simulate. As a result, there is no assurance that the learner will make a smooth transition of knowledge from the simulated situation to the actual clinical environment. So what are our future directions? Healthcare has come to appreciate the value of simulation and its role in education, training, evaluation, and research is important. The field of obstetrical simulation has grown substantially over the past decade. And thus far, the literature supports simulation as an essential tool for practicing routine and critical events and improving technical proficiency and team. Simulation also can serve as a strategy for improving procedure behavior skills, potentially mitigating adverse perinatal events. More research is also needed to determine whether the obstetric simulation leads to a significant reduction in the risk of birth-related injury and improved birth health. So we need to answer the following questions to move forward. <clears throat> is there an interaction between training design, intervention, in situ, off-site uh, off simulation, and, and uh, healthcare professional reactions and work environment? 
do training design intervention in situ of site simulation affect learning and organization? What does the literature reveal about knowledge testing in a simulated multidisciplinary training program? What are the characteristics of simulation that healthcare professionals perceive to be influential for learning and the transfer of learned skills and knowledge to a clinical setting? This means if you do simulation in a certain course, does it really affect the skill and knowledge in real life? So that was my uh, presentation. Sim one, do one, teach one, the past, the present, and the future of simulation. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Dana, for your valuable session regarding VPS simulation in obstetrics. Uh, well, uh, we are going to open a floor for discussion. So if you uh, have any questions, please just raise your hand. Any questions for uh, Dr. Uh, Dania? Uh, okay, I just have uh, one question for you, Dr. Dania. Um, there is any obstacles in, in preparing and conducting simulation BPH from your point of view, either uh, with uh, trainees or trainers? Honestly, yes, <laughs> it needs a lot of planning. You need to make mm. sure that the faculty are free. You need to make sure that the people can muscle and free themselves on that day. You need to make sure that the residents or trainers are also free to come and uh, attend uh, such session. And you need to also make sure that the simulation lab is free. You know, sometimes, yeah, you need to plan ahead, but uh, you know, obstacles not, but it just needs a bit of uh, planning. Yeah, and it's planning yeah, okay. rather than uh, obstacles. Alhamdulillah, no obstacles. KFMC, they're very open. They, they uh, welcome such uh, yeah, programs and courses. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we, we are going to... Uh, you, do, do you have any questions before I uh, wrap up this uh, session? Okay, thank you so much for your have been with us, uh, Dr. Dania, and for uh, our participants uh, for uh, their uh, listening and uh, uh, and participating in this uh, session. And um, I think uh, on Friday we have uh, the rest of uh, uh, scheduling for uh, the simulation week uh, in 2020. So we invite you to join us. And thank you so much for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.